We've been talking about the surface cir about the circulation of the ocean. Today we want to focus in on focus, focus, put your binds in the focus, on the ocean surface circulation. So what happens on the surface? Now we've already learned about some of the surface circulation, but we want to get into the details, the nitty gritty details, so we can really understand it. In fact, I've got a guest lecturer who's going to help us with that, Dr. Sean. Okay, so let's get at that right now. Okay. Hey, surface currents, just some uh, sort of definitional things. A surface current is a current that goes down to 200 meters, which is about 650 feet. Remember, the oceans are much, much deeper. On average, I believe it's 10 or 11,000 feet deep. So this is just the top part of the ocean, right? It represents about 10% of the water in the ocean. They flow long distances across the ocean. They produce something called a, a gyre. A gyre. You might have heard of a gyroscope, something that kind of does a circle. Well, let's talk about a gyre now. A gyre is the cir or a circular motion of water in each of the major ocean basins. So essentially what you have is you have surface currents in each major ocean. So if we look here at the Pacific Ocean, you've got this um, gyre, which basically is this circular motion of water in each of the major oceans. Now, make a note they don't all flow in the same direction. But if you're in the northern hemisphere, if you kind of think of it this way, as that's roughly the equator, pretty close, the, in the northern hemisphere, they rotate um, clockwise. And in the southern hemisphere, they rotate counterclockwise. Right? Do you see that? Yeah, that's right. Okay. And that, of course, is because of the Coriolis effect that we learned about in a previous podcast. Turns out there are first five ocean-wide gyres, one in the North Atlantic, the South Atlantic. Remember, they're gonna, this is clockwise and this is anti-clockwise, or <laughs> anti-clockwise, counterclockwise, in North Pacific and uh, South Pacific and in the, in the ocean. Each is flanked by a strong and narrow western boundary current and a weak easter boundary current. That's probably not that important. Okay. Now the importance of this, this totally affects the Earth's climate. It transports energy from the low latitudes to the high latitudes. Let's go back and look at that. If you think about that, we've got energy here at the low latitudes, which is like roughly at the equator, and it's pushing the energy up higher. So it's basically warming up the northern latitudes. If you did not have these, then you'd like to have an ice age or something like that, right? That'd be just bad because uh, the energy is being transported north. That's right, being transported north. All right, and we already said that. Okay, um, this then leads to different coastal temperatures based upon these gyres. So, for example, if you look at the east coast, since the energy is coming from the you know the equator up here, it keeps this water right here in the eastern coast of the United States quite warm because the energy is going that um, that way. Now, if you look at the gyre in the uh, North Pacific Ocean, it's kind of on both sides of this map. So it's going to start here as the Japanese current, and then it's going to drop back down, that's over here, and get all cold. But as it turns out that the water, or the energy that's hitting kind of southern Alaska, right down through here, is actually quite warm water. And it then starts to cool, because of course it is up in Alaska, and you start to get cold water. The, the blue represents the cold. And I want to kind of tell you an interesting story about that. My West Coast story. A number of years ago, my son and my, my his grandfather, my dad, uh, took a uh, visit to Alaska. So here we are on my dad's 50-foot boat. He had a 50-foot boat. Um, actually, after my my mother passed away, he took uh, he took he took the house uh, the savings. That's what I'm trying to say. Sold the house and bought a boat. He lived on the boat for like four years. And he took Caleb and I. Now Caleb is now like way up here in height. He's like a, a a junior right now in high school, and he's six feet tall, and I'm not. And um, anyways, we're in Alaska right here. So here I am in Alaska, and because of that warm water current, I decided that you know since I'm a triathlete. I ought to go fishing. So I put on my wetsuit. It still wasn't exactly warm water, but it was sort of warm-ish. And I went swimming. Interesting thing, I, I got chased by seals as I was out swimming in the waters off the coast of Alaska. So that was kind of cool. All right. Um, then we have a, a couple other definitions. There's something called an easterly and a westerly. And it just, it's something that confuses students, and I want to make sure you're not confused. You're not allowed to be confused in my class. You must learn, 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 learn. <laughs> an easterly it's wind, uh, blows from the east. That makes sense in easterly, but it's important to note from the east, but it blows to the west. And from the east towards the west. So it, it goes this direction. And a westerly blows from the west towards the east. 
So it's actually, it blows east. It's kind of, it sounds backwards actually if you think about it. An esterly, esterly, an easterly <laughs> blows west, and a westerly blows east. Kind of weird. Okay. And you can kind of see our easterlies. Here is the, the global wind pattern here, which of course affects the global um, surface currents because uh, surface currents are caused by the wind. And so if you look here uh, in the, um, uh, the tropical easterlies, all right, here we have the tropical easterlies, and they go um, in the northern latitudes, and that goes off to the east. We have tropical easterlies that go off to the west and we east. <laughs> west and west here and west here so we have these interesting global patterns and sometimes when they mix it causes all kinds of interesting things when those polars get down into where we live we we live here in this section uh, we're about 39 here woodland park we're at 39 degrees north latitude and so generally speaking we get winds from the west and if you think about that our weather patterns typically come from the west not very often from the east occasionally but not very often, but mostly that Okay, that leads us to kind of a con, uh, convoluted topic that I think is confusing from the textbook. It's called the Ekman Drift, and I'm not going to go into too much details because I'm going to have Dr. Sean explain the Ekman Drift thing to you a little bit more because I want to just let him talk because he's an expert on this. But it's the horizontal movement of ocean, ocean water that results from the balance between the wind stress and the Coriolis effect. Essentially, you've got wind that goes in one direction. And then you got the Coriolis effect, which goes in the other direction. Actually, I'm probably drawing in the opposite direction because the Coriolis effect is, is an east-west thing. And then when you kind of put these arrows together, you get a curve. And that causes the curve in the, in the ocean currents, and it's called the Ekman Drift. All right? This leads us to the geostrophic currents. That's in the ocean, a current in which the horizontal pressure forces is balanced by the equal but opposite Coriolis effect. I would just get that definition down. And then an interesting thing, one of the results of all this is something called an upwelling. That is the upward movement of ocean water from deep in the ocean surface. Normally we've been talking about you got a big map, and you've got, you got you know, a, a continent, and we're talking about the currents going back and forth. But in this case, now I'm looking at you know, a continent, and now we're talking about the water moving from the bottom of the ocean to the top. That's an upwelling. Okay, where do upwellings occur? Pretty much on the edges of continents you find upwellings. These, by the way, um, and I think I'll say this later, these are the most nutrient-rich areas of the entire world in terms of the ocean, and you can find the best fishing in the world. You might have heard of people who go to Alaska to go fishing because some of the best fishing in the world is here because there's a lot of upwelling happening in there because of the nutrient richness, okay? Here's what causes the upwelling. Basically, you have wind that goes in one direction, that's the red arrows, and then you've got an ocean current coming in the other direction, and when it hits that, this sort of effect causes the water to rise and up well. Make sense? And here's another way to picture it. Here's your wind, and then you've got the upwelling, and it comes like this. But the cool thing is at the bottom here, there's all kinds of sediments from everything, and it gets upwelled. Upwelled? Is that a word? It just gets pushed up, and then you've got little fishies. And the fishies have food to eat, and then you have a very rich fish population. All the big, not all, but I'd say most of the fisheries, probably the vast majority, are near um, these kinds of upwelling uh, places in the world. Okay? Now let's do a short video clip on upwelling. I went swimming once, and the water was really cold. My mom said it was an upwelling, but what's that? The coastal upwelling that you experienced is different from thermohaline circulation. It only brings up cold water from a few hundred meters deep. It's also not as cold as AABW or NADW. Coastal upwelling is generally caused by wind. Is upwelling important? Good question. Upwelling brings lots of nutrients up from deep water. We are researching the impact of nitrogen, a crucial nutrient, on Florida Keys reefs. How does upwelling affect the reef? It appears that there have been major changes in the health and community structure of coral reefs here in the Keys and throughout the world. By observing the nitrogen composition of sponges, we can determine the importance of different nitrogen sources. Wow, you've given us a lot to think about. Thanks, Dr. Martins. You're welcome. Good luck on your project. That was cool. Okay, hey, now...